This is Wild on 7th, your favorite wild podcast. Did you guys see this? This is unbelievable. What is that all about, Kinger? Get in here for the real thing. Like, let's get weird. Maybe I blacked out trying to figure out what was going on. Doubt, worry, fear, because that's what we're breaking the mold on here. Welcome to Wild on 7th, presented by Pilot Games. We're here until it's here. Okay, welcome back to Wild on 7th, your favorite wild podcast presented by Pilot Games. If you're out enjoying your libations. Please make sure to use their products. Uh, they're, you know, they're entertaining. They're fun. They you are. Can, you can win a little bit. And when you win. Every, your community wins. That's true. That's, that's true. That's fantastic. That's a lot of winning. All right, well, the Wild are, uh, we're recording this on Monday. The Wild are still in the midst of what feels like a marathon road trip that Started with a back-to-back over a week ago, Winnipeg, Chicago, then to Colorado, Vegas, San Jose, before now finally finishing up in L.A. this evening. Uh, so we, the, our broadcast game was on and off. This was, a, this was an odd trip for us. It looks like the way that the national broadcast selected their schedule, it looks like they thought the Wild were going to be a playoff team, much like we did. Yep, because they wanted to poach the games at the end of the year and try to pick the ones that they thought would matter. Minnesota, L.A., I think so. I think everybody thought Seattle would be a team. They they plucked that one. They took Minnesota, Colorado. So I, everything looks like they thought the Wild were going to be a playoff team. Um, so now we're sitting here on Monday getting ready to watch this game. Those national broadcasters poached it. I had anxiety at the start of the year, like, man, we – if we're if we're broadcasting playoff games, like we we got to be there to watch these games, um, but didn't work out that way. Uh, but what, you watched the road trip. What do you think so far? Well, I wanted to hear what it was like on the road. So when a team is kind of almost out of it, right, and on the way on the trip, they get eliminated. Um, what was the vibe like around the team? You're on the road. You got all these rookies. They're putting new guys in the lineup. They're trying stuff. I'm just, is it like loose? Was it kind of fun? Especially you got you know some days where you get off because of the national. Like what was the what was it like? Yeah, I missed. I we didn't have the Colorado game where after that they were officially eliminated. So we I wasn't around for that. The Vegas game. The, I, I think. Everybody was kind of down. I think you look at the play, too. I think they felt bad for themselves, which is maybe that's not the right thing to say, but there was they, they let off the gas pedal for sure. And whether they were feeling sorry for themselves or reality sunk in, whatever it might be, I'm not sure. But they were, at, at that time, 16, maybe 16-8-2 16, and two going into that Vegas game, maybe 16-9-2 and two from the... I think the All Star break on kind of like that's a that's a good record that's a playoff record. Well, we're gonna be right around ninety points. I mean, you, you typically a lot of years that makes it. That's a nice little yeah. number. You so, know, you feel pretty good about yourself. But this year has just been weird. We beat the seems like we beat the bad teams and lose yeah. to the good ones. And they put a run together. That's my point is they put a pretty good run together to make some noise and try to become you know playoff relevant. And give them credit. I think they hung in there right till the very end. Uh, but when the Colorado game comes and goes, they lose that one. It's over. I think there was some sag. That, that certainly showed up. So how was the trip? I think losing to Winnipeg, that one stung a little bit. They went to Chicago. That was, that was an easy game for them. Um, I think that they understand the narrative that they can beat the bad teams. They beat everybody they should. They can't beat the good teams. They wanted to find a way to beat Colorado. Didn't do it. Uh, I don't think... It just seems like nobody can stop Nathan McKinnon right now. Um, He's something. I mean, it's he is just flying. I it's 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 awesome. I I remember remember way back when when he kind of squared off with Granlund, and I we beat him in a playoff series. And I remember thinking like, you know, Granlund was the better player than uh, McKinnon at the time because I'm from Minnesota and clearly don't always see things super clearly but yeah he's playing at a high rpm right now yeah that dude's he he's pretty impressive too though because he's he's skilled he's fast but he's strong i remember i was playing against him here at xl and i hit him once i don't think he liked it and then i'm coming on a breakout maybe like the next shift 
and he comes. I, I didn't think he was going to hit me, but he had me right in his sights. Hits me right in the chest, and he pops my helmet. We had the white helmets on, too. Pops my helmet off like a zit. Just It just goes boom, <laughs> straight up. Um, he buried me, and uh, it's one of those ones where I had a double take and look at it. I'd be like, who the heck was that? That was Nathan McKinnon. And then I was embarrassed for a little bit because he was like a young, skilled guy. <laughs> so, well, he's got that Crosby, like, what, they're from the same Coal Harbor or whatever. I mean, they just... They're just hockey nerds. They love it. They they work hard every off season. Yeah, he looks. I was just it was troubling to watch him and then their coach just had some of the best gray hair I've ever seen. That uh that head coach of the Avs has got some great Bednar, he's a good looking dude. Good looking dude. And I was just kind of feeling sorry for myself. We're getting eliminated. McKinnon looks like the old Babe Ruth home run trot where it's on like too fast a speed <laughs> cut to the bench. They got this handsome devil. I just, yeah, that was not a good point. I did want one kind of signature win. Just I wanted us just to F up one of these playoff well, teams. Could be LA. Yeah. Tonight. Right. Uh, I mean, I, I, that'd be good. That'd be good. Um, but I just get one kind of that. No one saw. It would have been nice to beat Vegas. That one would have been nice. Oh, for sure. I because Vegas is they're, they're jockeying for, I think home ice playoff position. They ha- they were the only team in the West that hadn't locked up their playoff spot yet. So if you win that game, you create a little tension. You keep them on the edge of their seat a little bit with a couple games left to go. But this road trip, let's let real quick though, if the Wild had won a bunch of these games and they're 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 two points back of a playoff spot going into this road trip. But I don't, I, I don't know. It would have taken the wind right out of their sail. They, to go back to back, Winnipeg, Chicago, straight to Colorado, right to Vegas, back to back with San Jose, another day, LA. It, what is it, like 11 day trip? 10. You're 10, saying if we would have made it, we would have been. It still would have been. DOA. Oh my gosh. Just exhausted. Yeah, like you, on the road, that's the number one thing I picked up because we started on the road, we left. Then we pick up back on the road. It it was a it's a taxing road trip, and some of it might be situational, like where they're at and everything else. But um, it it would have been the way the schedule was lined up. This would have been tough to make a run. Uh, they beat the teams they should, Chicago and San Jose. But it made me think, and I'm sure you'll hate this idea, but there's I wanted a play in round. I was like looking because there's like the really bad teams. And then there's like us and St. Louis was on TV this weekend fighting for their life, almost you know a little ahead of us. And I I did kind of have a little NBA moment where I'm like, you know what? It's just the time of year you put your sunglasses on your hat, right? You got the golf shirts out, trying to figure out if you should wear shorts in the morning, and we're out of it, right? So I kind of wanted to play in round. I don't know what that would look like. I don't want to mess up the integrity of the 16W Stanley Cup playoffs, but like. I do feel like there's this middle tier of teams that deserve better. And I don't know. I was just like, God, I'd do it. I'd be so sick for one game, <laughs> some playing round somewhere. Give me something because we're, we're a tweener. You know, we're right in the middle there. I feel like you should still be able to backdoor into it or give us a weird tournament that decides a draft pick or something. I just want spring hockey in the world. You know what would be great is if instead of your record, Oh, top draft pick! You for play the, for it. You would play be the for it. Best, yeah. And whoever wins gets, gets it. it. Awesome! Wouldn't that be great? The Celebrini Cup, like a sixteen-game tournament over like one weekend. And just, he's just there. Like your kids. He gives you the trophy, and then he actually goes with the trophy. You just <laughs> you s- you all walk off the ice together. How sick would that be? I'd love that. The Celebrini. That'd Cup. get rid of tanking. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, I just need something. I just feel kind of gypped. Uh, it kind of makes you a little bit distasteful about even watching the NHL playoffs when you're not in it. It's sort of like, eh. I know I will. I got some ideas on girlfriend teams we can talk about later, but you're going to make a case today, aren't you? Yeah. And before before we get to that, uh, let's take a second to talk about Kaprizov. How, um, the best. I, yeah, I see you've got an order or two on there, but this guy's been unbelievable. Well, I heard something that uh, – let's start with more serious stuff. This is good, though. He's just – so 93 – uh, points, 44 goals. Now he's missing 10 games this year, so he's gonna he's flirting with 100, uh, playing about 73, 74 games. Um, absolutely on fire, second half of the year, strong as an ox. 
Um, I just, he's kind of almost like smirking out there too. Whenever you see the pictures of him, even on the Instagram, even when he scores, he just sort of has this look like, you know, well, uh, yeah, he's just, he's a stud. He's a legit superstar in our miss. And there's a pretty big gap, even Boldy, you know, 66 points, X 63 points, Zuki 62 points. This dude's hanging up there at 93. That's what we call an NHL store guy. Yeah. So he has had like one of the best second halves of awesome. the season. Yeah. And the Art Ross Trophy has been a fun race to watch. Like Kucherov and McKinnon the, mm -hmm. and even McDavid. McDavid hasn't been playing, so it's kind of it's tailed off a little bit. But these guys are scoring three points tonight. So is Kirill. Mm -hmm. I think he's had like eight three-point games this season alone. He could get a hat trick at any time. At, at any night. You can't keep him off the score sheet. But I think he's had the best turnaround from the first half to the second half. Do you remember at the start of the year where we were talking about how it looked like he was he was hurting? Almost like he was out of shape. Uh, you know, like a slow was start. Wrong. Something's wrong with his hands. It was yeah. skating. Remember, we were like, he's not, it doesn't look like he's skating. It never right? looked like Kirill. Yeah. They moved him to the uh, what, what was the boldy spot on the power play this year. So it would be opposite Ovechkin, that flank, so he could get the one-timers. Where are he scoring all of his goals from on the power play? And he was getting one-timers and missing them. And you're like, hey, this guy, he never misses. So something was up, and that might be the reason why. But the first half of the year, so the first 42 games, and that's probably where he missed some of them too, but 34 points. Now the second half of the year, one of the best turnarounds. He's got 59 points. Yeah. So all of a sudden he's gone from under a point per game to almost 1.5 points per game the second half of the season. And this is where you like you look at it, you go, this guy's a winner. Like that's when they they needed these points. And you, you still can you can watch these games and you can tell like when they need it, all of a sudden he turns up the dial a little bit. He's just he's just so fun to watch. It is. Yeah. Kirill being Kirill is pretty great. I uh, I heard something about him. You want to hear this? Yeah. Unless you're still doing well, analysis. Do your analysis. Give me more. No, the the other one that where you – this is – sometimes guys are special, and, and there's just no way to really describe it. But when you see it, you kind of know it. When he scored in the San Jose game on the point shot, I was like, that's it. Th that's how you show it. That, that shot that he – did you see it? Like a floater from the point. They just go D to D. He floats it from the point. It goes off the D-man, off the post, off the goalie and in. Meant to be. Every – Every D-man throws like three of those per game <laughs> at the net, and they never go in. Yeah. Kirill's in that spot once. Yeah. He's covering for a D-man one time. Turns to the D. Hey, I don't see it what comes, the problem is. Comes D to D. He just collects it, floats it in. It goes boom, 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 in. I, I wish they had an ISO cam on the bench because I bet you they all looked at each other like, seriously, seriously? Like, we do that all day, every day. It doesn't go in. Like, maybe... He is that good where he's some type of Jedi or Jedi where he can put the right spin on the puck at the right time after he releases it, like spins it off the dude's pads, off the post, and then have the goalie kick it back in the net. I don't know, man, but it, like that goal to me was like 44th on the year. Are you kidding? That, that's how you get it? That might have been the 43rd. I don't remember. but Yeah, he's a stud. So I, the thing I heard about him, this is a gift we can give him back. I think this is accurate. I, I was hoping we had one of the players on today to confirm or kind of get to the bottom of this. So I, I ran into one of our favorite uh, sushi proprietors this weekend. Oh, you uh, ran into him? I, I did see him, yep, yeah, um, Mr. Billy. And, uh, and he told me that Kirill's family, um, the name that they all call each other over in Russia is Caprice. Okay, so it would be like Karts or Kinger. So like my son is a kinger, I'm a kinger. That's the like shorthand name that is, if you're one of us, that's what they call you. And apparently 97 wants to be called Caprice. That's what he wants to be referred to over here. That because that's his family lineage, that's his name. That's what makes him feel like his father and grandfather. So I think I'm just going to call him Caprice the rest of the time we do the podcast. Not sure if it's true. Not sure if it's the sushi man. I would love that if you were screwed. set up. I looked it up to like make sure it wasn't a bad word like in in Russian like something and he's really doing me dirty but like I think it's true. 
So I was going to say, if like Moose was here or somebody today, I was just going to be like, hey, just start mixing in Caprice. And if he just gives you a warm look back, like you've just given him his entire family tree in the United States, I, I, I think it's legit Caprice. Right away, we said you're your favorite wild podcast. This is our gift. I, I'm trying to think about how you how we could use that to help get him on the pod. No, no, just to be like, because <laughs> like, we're not in a situation ever where we would call him out and be like, "Hey, Kirill," or "Hey." But he doesn't want to be called that. Even he doesn't even want to be called Caprice off. He wants to be called Caprice. Yeah, but when do you like? When would we? How would we check that? We'd have to have him. Well, we'd have to get you one can't of be the like, hey, Caprice, and then have him snap his neck. Maybe you could do that. Well, I, I, that's why Next I practice. wanted. I thought one Just, of these. I thought one of these injured guys would be here today, and I could be like, hey, I want you to mix this in. I want to see if the warmth changes. I want to see if he pulls you aside in the stairwell. Hey, I noticed you call me Caprice. You know, I come from a long line of Caprices, and this makes me feel like I'm home. You know, like a, like a borscht in my heart. I, I think it's real. I don't know. I'm going with Caprice. Like, if I got a jersey, 97 jersey, I would just put Caprice on the back. So tell us about this uh, the sushi. Get. Well, hold on. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, it's a, I it's, sat down it, with Kirill last year over a bowl of borscht. Yeah, do you recall that? Yeah, I haven't got anywhere and He was in to Italy. Him. We talked about him going to Italy and what he liked, what he ate. And yeah. he, he yeah. just likes a good, like, pomodoro sauce with a good noodle. Pretty simple guy. And his eggs. Yeah. Is it is it possible that there was some misinterpretation? He just likes, like, a caprese salad maybe it's, a little it's bit? It's possible. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Um I don't, maybe. I, I, it's all I got. I mean, it's a good nugget. I, it was the closest I felt like a journalist, like, you know, like you doing the pod. I was like, hey, I might be onto something here. Like, if we can help him. Be, Breaking news. If we can give him his coat of arms, like his name, uh, we should do that. Caprice. I don't know. It sounds cool, too. It does seem like that's what you would call him if you knew him. It might be right. So, how did you run into this? I went to. Uh, the restaurant and uh <laughs> so, so you, you happened to run into him at his restaurant my daughter's birthday um <laughs> and uh i so did you go there for your wife's birthday yes and oh, wow. and so one of the things i was concerned about was i we had a lot of fun the first time we went there but i didn't want it's it's weird when you have fun with someone that you don't really know it's almost like if you you met somebody once and it was a great time if you see them again you're sort of like you're going to like ruin it or something, you know, but, uh, so you're kind of feeling like it was a one night, one night stand kind of thing. Well, I, I would more for, for, for him, not for us. We know we would always like to see him, but, um, so we went down to, yeah, Billy sushi and, um, actually I was a little relieved because Billy is pretty, he's pretty wild. You can get billied. Um, and, uh, and I, we were in a four top, but um, he pulled up a chair and talked to us. And that story was mixed into some of the life advice he gave our daughter on her 26th birthday. So I don't know. I'm just trying to do my part as a journalist for Wild on 7th. So tell us why Peyton was back in town. Uh, Frozen Four, um, another, <laughs> another misguided sports memory in my history. My Boston College Eagles uh, got right to the um, precipice. Um, same as the uh, Golden Gophers last year, and then we're just beaten by Denver in the championship game. You had a full house, lots of uh, Boston people around for the Frozen Four. It was buzzing down here, by the way. It was 80 degrees, and it's pretty cool. The X was, was a great event. I like the Frozen Four. Well, it, it, nobody was going to beat David Carl. Like, uh, Denver's coach is on an absolute yeah, heater right now. With the now. ginger, I mean. We, yeah. he, he won the World, cha or World Junior. Yep. He's World got two out of three national championships, right? Yeah. yeah Send him to the world championships. This guy. Yeah, they should, or the Olympics. Oh, maybe Billy will get him on staff. But they are uh, – they dismantled people. I mean, Michigan was playing better than anybody in the country, and they just neutralized them to nothing. And BC has been number one all year. These superstars can't be stopped, and they shut them out. It's crazy. Well, the goaltender never been, guessed that, that tournament had some of the best goaltending that uh, I think I've seen in college hockey. Period. Did you see the quote the Leonard kid? I, I don't. Uh, this is me doing another journalism thing because someone read this on their phone to me. Who knows if it's even true? But the quote was, uh, "I thought we were the better team. We just got beat by a goalie." I thought that was an inter interesting one to lay out there after the loss for BC. But uh, he's the guy that got robbed on the shot, Leonard. So. That, that was his. That could that be was, misinterpreted as our goalie stinks. 
But the, the goaltending in that game was good, right? Both yes. sides. That Fowler's a good goalie for BC as well, yes. So what, what, I was watching, what was the first game? Denver and... Uh, Michigan. BU? Was it uh, Denver BU? Uh, yeah. Yes. In Denver Michigan, BU BC, yeah. in the sports book in Vegas, which is kind of great. That it was like four in the afternoon. You're watching these games. Weird start times. Like the championship game started at five central, which I don't know why they would do that. They six o'clock East Coast. I mean, I don't know. Just don't want anyone to watch it or what? Yeah, I actually thought. I think we were there a little bit earlier too, watching those those games. Because what was the first? The first game in the semis was started at like three o'clock in the afternoon central time. Is that right? Or maybe earlier. Uh, they're both the same day. Anyways, four o'clock. Anyways, we were watching that. That had some of the best goaltending uh, I've ever seen. I think BU that was, was unbelievable. Overtime there. or the double BU overtime. goalie is what you're talking about. Yeah. The guy that was just like, yeah, there was some great goaltending in the tournament overall, regions and the final. So you're at the championship game. Any tears shed? No, it was. We went to Mancini's afterward. Did a little dancing. Um, had some of the the bread. You know how they have the uh, grilled bread there. Um, it was okay. I, I just, I'm tired of losing. Um, <laughs> I, uh, and then I watched the world championship with the USA women. I don't know why I'm seeking victory in all parts of my life. I got the Edina high school usually gives me something every March, but I just, I don't know. I just, I want to win. I, I want wins. Maybe you need to try reverse psychology, start seeking losses. I should just start like picking the worst teams and watching the worst games. Just like, wanting your team to lose. Yeah, cheering for something. But I, uh, no, I, it was okay. Um, I don't, I would like to get a, the part of it is for my kids, right? So um, one born in 98, the other one born in 01, they've never, they've never had any victory at all in anything. Okay. So they, the gopher hockey team, they were too young in 02, 03. Nothing on the pro sports side. Kind of missed the links thing that happened here. Um, no high school. Uh, neither of their colleges. Um, so it's like I kind of want like one sports success for the family. The daughter also went to Boston College. So if we could have won one, just be like, yeah, go buy an ugly hat on Fanatics with Giant Champion. You know, get your little poster and pennant and uh, – and go. I mean, you got the cup, obviously, but I just, it's kind of cool as a sports fan to have some, you know, win the last game moments, but haven't really had a great track record in the old King family for 26 years for the daughter and, and 22 for the son. So on the podcast here, we like to eat our feelings a little bit, but it's summer's around the corner. Like the weekend was great. It was oh, 70, it was awesome. 80 degrees out. Awesome. And if you want your summer body, but at the same time, you have to eat your feelings yeah. what kind of snacks would you like to have yeah you're probably asking the wrong guy but i would go with coleslaw um <laughs> personally because that's, veg that's a vegetable it it is and it's delicious and um it's hand cut fresh ingredients all natural i mean these guys still do it they jimmy's guy said to me you know we're not trying to make the model t and I said, I know. And if you did, it would be delicious. But um, it's it's great. They got the original. They got the pineapple. Um, it's it's refined. It's refrigerated. Uh, check it out. You can find it at Cub, a local company, Jimmy's. Go get that coleslaw. Don't you be messing with my dressing. How about you? Uh, if you were going to construct a summer body um, and try to get yourself in beach shape uh, for Gem Lake, what would you do? I would throw shingles over my shoulder and uh, roof a little bit. That's what I would do. But, uh, no, it, it is. It's, it's roofing season. And if you were in one of those areas that had a, a massive storm, potential hail damage, uh, you, you're going to want to get that looked at. And our guys at Wild Construction will take care of you. Like They like to make things happen. So, uh they can officially get up on the roof. They'll check it out. They'll make sure that you're taken care of. They've leveled up, too. It's no longer, well, they still work, wildconstructionmn.com. But uh, if this is an indication of how good of a job they do, it's just wildconstruction.com. They've Man, bought the new big, domain name. That's a big deal. The only way you could do that go is on if like, you're good at your job. GoDaddy.com. They take care of you. Yeah, they take care of you. Wild Construction, they'll make it happen. Check them out. So, hey, we're going to have some fun today. We're going to go um, to court, right? This is like law and order. We're going to like uh, make our case 
Is that what's well, happening? Well, I want to make I want to make the case for Faber for Calder. That's what that's what we're gonna do. Yeah, right. And now. I'm gonna help. I'm gonna be like your flavor fave. Flavor fave? Is that his name? You got a clock on your neck? I got my clock on my neck. I'm the hype guy, right? Yeah, we got one of the watches. You should hang that around your neck. But I'm going to like, I'm going to be like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to chime in. You've done some of this analysis. Yeah, who's the the favorite? Uh, Everybody likes this little Canadian prodigy that gets spoon fed to us like all the rest of them. He's living inside a bubble. Connor Bedard. He's got his little Nemo fish bubble. Well, why don't you make um, the case for him real quick? Why why he should get it? I won't. Um, so here's here's what we should know um, about this. So I looked it up. The Calder Award is given to the player that is most proficient in his first season. And then what looked up that's the, word, the definition. Yes. Yeah. Then looked up the word proficient, competent, or skilled. Okay. So I will just start by making the case that Connor Bedard was injured for a huge chunk of the season. So durability should factor in. Absolutely. Brock Faber is working his way to an 82-game season. That means missing none, folks, if you know, can do the math at home. Big, strong, young man. Didn't get banged up. Made it through an entire season playing a heavy load of minutes. Um, so Bedard is hurt for a huge swath of the season. So just on face value, if I was like sitting there with a gavel in a powdered wig and it was today, here ye, here we, we gather for the most proficient in first season. And one of the young men didn't play most of his first season. Well, he's not going to win. I don't care how good he was the rest of the time. Proficient means got the job done. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I don't know. I, I, I what are so if his I was devil, if I was devil's advocate, this is the case. Well, he did miss all that time, and he still has more points than Brock Faber, nearly twenty more points than forward. Brock yeah, versus defenseman forward. Um, well, here's the case for Bedard. He's the next great player. He shoots like nobody else. It's good for the league. Um, it's almost In like Chicago. It's almost like the Hobie Baker. Give it to Macklin Celebrini because when you look back historically on people that have won the award, he's going to be the biggest star. We want him to be. And we want to go reverse engineer so that, you know, they're probably mad that I don't think Gretzky won the Calder and, you know, and, and they're, but they would, lo- they want to, they want their br- biggest star to get the rookie of the year award. Um, but I think there's a, what I hope happens, and I want to, you're going to make your case, is I just hope there's a whole bunch of people that try to outsmart the system. And so, like, everybody votes for Faber because they think they're being a contrarian and they've got some angle. And, and then when it's all said and done, it actually adds up for him. And maybe he steals it because a bunch of people thought they were being contrarian and actually everyone went contrarian. I, I don't know. I don't know you if that's that's his possible. only way? Yeah, I think I think it's a statement vote. I think it says um, it's a hot take. You know, I think this kid I, in in Minnesota, uh, he played more. He was more valuable to his team. Um, he's showing leadership qualities. He's got a bunch of points. I'm gonna I'm gonna be different by voting for Brock Faber. I think that's a part of it. With the journalists, I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, I, and. But you're saying there's actually just some math here that's in his favor. Yeah, and I think in his favor. So who votes on it is the professional, uh, like hockey writers association, and they vote. So I don't know how many votes that is, but I think it's a lot, and I think they factor in some different stuff too. And it, it is impressive that Bedard is truly a rookie. So there's like freshmen, then there's redshirt freshmen, and then you know all of the other things, and they always factor that stuff in. So he's truly a rookie. He was drafted last year, comes right in, plays. It's that's impressive. It is. Faber is a couple years older, um, so that's another argument for Bedard. But that that isn't part of what it says in the definition. Either. Proficient it, it, in his first season. Yeah. Not, a, it, season being, not in his... Season being an 82-game NHL regular season, I think is what they're referring to, Ryan. Yeah. Not most proficient at his age in the se- during his first season. Or the part of the season. But that was Kirill's knock, too, is that he's too old. Yeah. 
but he wasn't. He was perfect. So they're always they're going to be compared, and then when they're looking at rookies, they're comparing them to each other. So yep. it's it's Faber Bedard, who's had the better season, and you just compare them to each other, which I, I don't think that you can do that, right? Because one's a forward, one's a D, and it's not apples to apples. I think what you have to do in order to find if it's proficient is to compare them to their position. So Connor Bedard to his position, how has he been? Well, he actually has been pretty good. So he's got .91 points per game. He's got 66 games played, so he's missed, what, 14 with that injury? So if you were to look at all forwards in the NHL in points per game, he's .91, that ranks 55th in the NHL. Pretty darn good. So he's a top 50, he's a top 60 point producing forward. Now he is a minus 41, and I should <laughs> I, I should look at where that ranks. He might he might be leading the NHL in rookie points and also minus. I think there's a couple guys like minus 44 or something from San Jose. But anyways, we'll, we'll get to the plus minus in a minute. 55th among forwards. Now you go to Faber. He's 0. 0.56 points per game. He's a defenseman. So. 0.91 is that is going to stand out much more than 0.56 points per game. But Faber is a defenseman. Now, where does that rank amongst defensemen? His position, 33rd. So all of a sudden now you start to look at it, you're like, okay, well, we've got we've got Bedard, who of all forwards is 55th. You've got Faber, who of all defensemen is 33rd. Yeah, and think of 32 teams, 33rd. So he's basically a top pair D. He's your top D. Right, no. I mean that's a that's a lot more valuable than a forward that's somewhere in the mix with the other million forwards. Yeah, and then you you we start to look at all of the other stuff. Like Faber is sixth in the NHL in time on ice. He's on a team that is negative. The Wild are negative thirteen. So if you look at the standings overall, the scoring on the year, the Wild have surrendered thirteen more goals than they have scored. Dash thirteen. Faber is a he's an even player. Connor Bedard, now Chicago's given up 100 goals or 103 goals on the year, something like that, and he's minus 41. So they have given up a bunch more, but Faber is, like, he's, he's a good, productive defender. Like, he is a quality player. Like, I think Faber, if he wanted 60 points, he might have them, but he might be dash 26. He's not. So I think you have to factor those things in, too. But I think if you make the case... Uh, of these guys against their position, Faber stands out as a much better defenseman in terms of an NHL defenseman than Bedard does in terms of a, an NHL forward. Yep. He's, he's higher up in the rankings. You'd take him earlier in the draft, right? If, you, if everybody was a free agent, everybody, who would you pick first, Bedard or Faber? I think Faber's likely picked in that overall NHL draft than Connor Bedard. So that's I think that's that's his case. Now he he was more important to the Wild. He has produced, he's been consistent, he hasn't been hurt. He's a an even player, was a plus player. I, I should check that. Is he is he even right now or is he a plus player? I think he's even. Yeah. When I looked this he's, morning. He's dead even. He is. So I, I go to – I want to ask you about that draft thing again. I'm not so sure about that as much as I love Brock. But the – so um, proficient, okay? What you, okay. So, so I think time on ice is a huge deal, as is durability. To me, Bedard is like a – you got a Porsche. You can only drive it in the summer, you know, because it's – the roads aren't always good here. We got the salt and everything. Really flashy when it does work. Um, but, you know – you also got to wear a bubble when you drive it, you know, that whole deal. And to me, Brock's like this F-150, right? Gonna, you should buy it, not lease it. You can put a ton of miles on it. It's not going to break down. It's going to be reliable. Um, you're going to keep it clean. I, I just think proficient uh, in their first season in the NHL. The, only, the question I was going to ask is, so, like, if there was a draft this year, and Bedard's in it. He's going ahead of Celebrini. He's still the top pick by every NHL team. Where Faber, well, I'm not saying I'm not saying a draft. What I meant is like imagine every player in the NHL is a free agent. 
like the NHL. So like Connor McDavid. Ah, okay. And you can Conor assemble be number your one overall. And you can assemble your team. You're saying there's a chance when people are putting the pieces together and they say, "Hey, I'm building 20, my team." 21 year old defenseman, 26 minutes. Yeah, he's going to be on someone's board before Much Bedard. Higher Bedard. God, you might just pull this thing off. Yeah. We got to get this to the Professional Hockey Writers Association. Is that what they're called? Yes. The PHWA. We should close circuit this to them. Can you tag them when we post this episode? So now let's just take a look at this. So, I understand what you're saying. Though. Yeah. Okay. So if, you, if every player in the NHL free agent and you're like, yes, okay, so whatever team gets a pick first, I'm taking Connor McDavid. I'm taking, you know, Nathan McKinnon. I'm taking Kale McCarr. I'm taking whatever it is. I, I, Brock Faber is certainly in the top 100 right now. I think yep. he's proven that. He'll be he's trending towards Olympic team, all those things. Yep. Yeah. And I, I think you could maybe make a case that Bedard would be maybe in the top 100 too. I, 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 don't, I don't know. But he would be. Need, needless to say, I think Faber's taken before. Yeah, because he's a it's, it's positional a, importance. It's a, everything it's, else, it's a more valuable and yes. harder to get thing. And he produced that value. And the proof of that is Celebrini. I mean, this guy every year somebody's running into the NCAA, scoring the most points <laughs> in their freshman season, getting drafted top five, and scoring sixty points their first year in the NHL. So that goal scoring thing, whether it's Logan Cooley, uh, Connor Bedard. Um, Celebrini, Fantilli, you can find it. That minute munching, someday wear a letter, uh, leadership on the back end, I agree with you, way harder to find a Kale McCarr, a John Carlson, a Brock Faber, um, a Victor Hedman. I mean, that is more valuable. So let's look at total minutes. Faber's played about 2,000 total minutes. Bedard has played 1,300 total minutes. Not very long. So Bedard, uh, Faber has played... 30% more, well, actually, it's 50% more than Bedard has. 700 minutes more. Yeah. Amazing. Proficient. Yeah. And now you can factor this in. He's earned all of those minutes. He yeah. wasn't given those minutes. This no. is a team that was chasing a playoff spot on a good hockey team. All these guys that are minus machines in the minus 30s and 40s, they're, they're given those minutes. Organizations know that they're going to give up scoring chances against, and they don't care. It's their development. Yeah, so they've been given these minutes. Like, you look at it, it's Philip Zadina in San Jose, minus 44. Kirishev in Chicago, minus 42. Bedard, minus 41. William Eklund, San Jose, minus 39. Kevin Korchinski, Chicago, minus 39. So you start to look at those guys, they're given those minutes. Like, the organiz if they were NHL like, second contract guys, they would not be getting these minutes. You know what? If we were really smart, we push for uh, Bedard to get minus forty-five. What green do they jacket, call that? Masters. Yeah. What do they call it? The yeah, the green jacket. Masters. Yeah, we need him. I think that really hurts his chances on Calder if he's the number one minus in the whole league. And I know he's close, but we should get in on that. We should get. We got to root for three minuses. And who are these other guys we need to have a good couple games here? San Jose, Zadina. He's dash 44. Yeah, come on, Zadina. Focus. And Go get some fish tacos. Get your mind right. Play one or two good games. And who's the other guy? The other guy's a Blackhawk, isn't it? Korchinski? Uh, Kirishev on Chicago. Yeah, see, that's not but, helping. So hold on. So let's actually look at it this way, too, because this is fair. This is fair. If we're going to say that Connor Bedard gets, like, we, we looked at the stat point per game. Minus per game. All these other guys, Zadina, 72 games played. Kirchev, 73 games played. Bedard is, yeah, he takes a he's, minus. He's better at minus. Two out of every three games. So if he played 14 more games, that would be another minus six. He would be minus 47 if he had played all the games. He's a minus based machine. Based on his rate. So he would have the green jacket. Do you think he was at Augusta? Did the Blackhawks play yesterday? Do you think no. he tried? I was the, he yeah, went I was, to fit, like, see if a green jacket fit him? I was there. I didn't see him. You went to the Masters? Yeah. I know you do that. You did go this year. Yeah, so I went after Chicago. So after the Chicago game. We didn't have the Colorado game, so there was a little window there where we were able to go. Is it as big of a bucket list thing as everybody says? Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, and I heard like this, everything's like cheap. Like you well, get, once like, you get on the grounds, it's Yeah, you get it's like little get on the sandwiches and... Um, whatever they pimento cheese sandwiches yeah. and yeah. drinks and yeah, that's great. 
Who you did know? you watch? Who were you? I was. Well, just the practice round. So pra- it was a little different. It was cool. It was different though. You like you see they'll have a practice pair. They'll hit like a normal shot and they'll hit it into the green. Then they'll put that roll that one towards the pin. Try to make it, but not try that hard. And then they'll just think about where the Sunday pin is. They'll drop like three golf balls and then they'll roll it from where they are to where the Sunday pin is. Or try to get a sense of it. Yeah, see how much it breaks, how fast it is. Um, so it's a little different. You can see the guys kind of practice, and you can also, it's not, there, you don't have great sight lines for every shot, but you can also see a guy that like as he tries to like draw it or he tries to cut it, or you can see the skill that they have like trying to do different things, which is kind of cool. Um, but but no yeah. sign of Bedard getting fitted for the green jacket as the biggest minus player. We didn't see that. Okay. I would just think they'd want to have a few of the guys measurements when they're it's coming down the stretch here. Just in case. Yeah. I mean like he's, if he, he has invited a good to chance, Butler's cabin. He's like the, don't want the jacket to be He's slipped. the Max Homa of the biggest minus in the league. I mean he's right around the Scotty Scheffler, Zadina, San Jose. I mean he I would get measurements on the kid. So if, are you do you want to have, well, you, if, have you done a final uh pin move like uh, on him or are we I think we're good. Okay. I I think um, co- whatever you're called, Professional Hockey Writers Association. WHL. Yeah, I think. PH. Let's vote for, let's all of you just WHA. think that you're being a wild card and you vote for Brock and then we just wake up and, oh my God, he won. I think that would be fun. That would be fun. Yeah, that'd be good. All right, well, uh, so Kinger, if you were to be fit. For a green jacket? Yeah. And you wanted to look good. Where would you probably pick up your groceries? Let's uh, let's have a word from our sponsors here because you should be drinking good, clean, quality water, and eating healthy foods from our friends at Cub. Uh, let's uh, take a break. Word from our sponsors. The Wild on Seventh podcast is sponsored by Cub, your hometown grocery store. It's getting nice out carts. Like uh, this is like the time you start looking at Manitou Ridge for tea times and. Cub has these little pub burgers. They're actually going to drop some off for me this afternoon to try them. They got a jalapeno cheese, six ounces, almost like little tasters, little sliders that you can cook up on the grill. Bunch of different flavors. Do anything else you can think of getting at Cub that people might like? Well, yeah. As a matter of fact, their their milk is the freshest around, and it might be the only spot to get our friend Kevin Gorg's basic. For cereal. Which, so if you want to try out what keeps Kevin Gorg up at night, you only get it at Cub. And I don't even know if that's a sugared cereal or an unsugared cereal, but uh, Gorgie likes it and he knows. Cub, uh, they're local. They're one of us. They're awesome. Check it out. Ryan Carter here, and I'm excited to announce that Aquarius Home Services is hosting its biggest event of the year, their open house at the Little Canada location, running from May 3rd to May 5th. Get ready to seize incredible savings on essential home services, including HVAC systems, Connecticut water treatment systems, generators, water heaters, and more. Join them for exclusive deals and unbeatable discounts that are unavailable anywhere else. Whether you're aiming to elevate your home's comfort or bolster its efficiency, their expert team is here to assist you. Circle the dates on your calendar and make sure to drop by the open house event. It's an opportunity you won't want to miss. Aquarius believes in earning the right to be recommended. They're just a click away at AquariusHomeServices.com. Welcome back. Uh, so, Carts, Car- we'll, we'll finish. Uh, I think part of what's fun when it's this weird stretch of the season where you're out of it, you do get a look at some of the, the yeah. kids, right? Yeah. So we got the shutout from... Um, Great Jesper, organizational move. Jesper Volstead got the shutout against Chicago. And uh, and Ogren. Oh, by the way, calling him Ogie is great. I wouldn't have expected that. That's very like Ogie Oglethorpe. I mean, that's a, that's a, was a surprising nickname, I thought, for Ogren. Being Liam Ogren, right? I, Ogie is a pretty great hockey nickname, as everyone would agree. He's also pitched in with... Uh, a couple points. So what do you make of the youngsters? Husty getting his first goal, Ogi, and Jesper. Well, if you didn't listen to the Volstead uh, podcast, go back and just listen to that interview because you start to get the sense of the, the mindset of the young man. And he's hungry. He wants to be an NHL goaltender. He was upset, really upset, it turns out, uh, after the Dallas game. He's kind of thrown to the wolves because the, the entire team had, like, the flu bug. They played, like, all on IVs. Not making that up, I don't know, but they were they were ill. They were ill, and he gives up seven. Now he didn't play great, and uh, he admitted that. But I think he was upset that he didn't get another shot either. That boom, it was it. that was it. So he had to go work on his game in Iowa. 
I think he, he through that that was good built a little bit of mental toughness and um, he's a he's a guy that wants it I think a guy that isn't afraid to work or prepare I, I do think he's a little green he doesn't quite know how to do that yet but he wants it and, he, he, and he's he's got to figure that out but I think a great organizational decision to allow him to play more games another game and specifically the game in Chicago because uh, and Chicago's not great but they're not awful like Carolina they almost tied Carolina or almost beat Carolina yesterday Carolina's like the cup favorite so they're, they're, it's not like a giveaway um, they're a beatable team but uh, he, he pitches a shutout so all of a sudden he goes from seven goals against to three and a half goals against and now he can start to feel good about what he's been able to do and how he's been able to play uh, I thought he was he looked nervous early in that Chicago game. And I, I said this in the San Jose game. Every period, he's gotten better and better and started to look better and better. And now I don't have, like, the sharpest eye for goaltending. But it's similar to, like, Kirill, where you you know. Brees. Yes. Brees. Like, there's there, there's a an element to goaltending where you, I can't really describe it. But when you see it, like, you know he looks good. You know he f- he's feeling good. You know it's confident. Um it's clean, and I started to see more and more and more of that. Like, there, there wasn't decision. It didn't look like he was in his own head. Should I play this puck? Should I not? Should I, you know, should I be aggressive? Should I come out? Should I stay in my net? It was less, like, thinking, more playing. And I think he's happy with the way he played. I, I was actually happy to see, too, he got scored on a couple times in the San Jose game, but how he bounced back, like, he didn't lose his mind, he didn't feel he had to be perfect, uh, I think all that stuff was good, I think this experience for him is going to be great, because it, it will fuel the hunger that he naturally has to be a goaltender, and I think that that's something that I th- internally they're fostering, is like, it, he has, like, that, that, that makeup as a person, to be good because he wants it so bad now you they have to just develop that the right way um and i think that that like i said great choice to have him in the lineup and playing a couple of games yeah it started really when that sweden team got banged up in the world juniors and he was so upset about how he played it's funny i interviewed him down in iowa about a couple weeks ago and it was just for this video and there was a question it was kind of a throwaway question i just said you know Looking back, you're obviously a big prospect. You know, looking back, what will you take with you from your time in Iowa? And he goes, he just goes, "Hey, man, I'm still here, and uh, <laughs> and I don't, you know, I gotta. This is where I'm at, and until I am not here, I mean, I can't reflect back on my time at Iowa. So I think you're absolutely right with that experience and against Dallas, and um, it was great to see him. Uh, I really like seeing the. Hoosty get his first goal. Um, He's looking good all of a sudden. Yeah, I think it's that three-piece suit he wears, and uh, he he just runs around. He's good on the face-off, and um, and then the Ogie kid won one two plus two. Um, that was a crazy game against San Jose. You had uh, Boldy with a couple, Merrill with two points. Brodeen's actually been very offensive this season. When you know when he's been healthy, he's really kind of even been some of his best hockey, I think. So, yeah, it was, we're beating up on the, uh, the teams we're supposed to beat up on and, and hopefully uh, learning some stuff the, for the other games. The kids are getting a chance to play, and it's good to see. And Let's talk about that in a second, but we first have to talk about why they're getting a chance to play, just for a second. I don't know. Let's reverse. What was nine months ago? Because everybody's having a baby right now. Scotty Scheffler is having yep, one. yep. Chandler Stevenson in Vegas was just having one. Yep. It's a it's a popular time and I don't know is it is, it, is April like a big birthday like Peyton. So that would mean you that, had Peyton's birthday. So that would mean that you're getting busy 10 months earlier. So a summer, it's like 4th of July. You're out on the boat. Yeah, boat snacks. <laughs> would that make sense? July <laughs> and then yeah, yeah, yeah. 40 weeks. It's right around. It's peak summer. Well, with hockey players, that's their only time off, right? So they go make the babies in the summer, and it just and seems all, like they all come do. It just seems like everybody's like. There's a. I just hear baby chatter all over the place right now. Like Scotty Scheffler. How about that though? He was ready to leave the Masters. If he's leading the Masters second nine, and he gets the call. I mean, you're he's just, out. You're just such a male hero for like 
all women everywhere if you do that. I mean, that's just a, that's a good PR move by him. That was a good PR move. Yeah. Would it, it'd be funny if he just didn't do it though. He's like, yeah. <laughs> It was, I don't know, but yeah, I, yeah, the baby hasn't even come yet, right? No, and I don't even know if it's that close, but it's a good. Anyways, look. Uh, there's good look. A, there's a lot of baby activity. These so days. that's part of the reason the kids are getting to play is these guys are on standby. Yeah. Okay, with like the pager, I did not know that. Okay, um, well, it's been fun to look at. I just like watching them. Uh, gives you some sense of what's to come. I do wonder if this year I see people sometimes at the health club on the treadmill with a weight vest on. And I wonder if there's some part of this season that's like us playing a season with a weight vest on. Even the cap hell, um, the Sweden trip, and and you look at what guys like Faber have had to develop and um, even Rossi. Maybe like if we put a season in with a weight vest, um, then it's when we finally get back to normal, normal money, um, you know, a year from now, maybe we'll just be like, it's like we've been training at altitude. Yeah. It, I'm hoping. It, it, it has felt like they've been able to, you know, like problems here. You're in the classroom and problems are putting up on the board and then you get the dry erase marker and it, it erases it, but not fully. Yeah. So then you go back up and you erase it not fully. And by the end of whatever called the trimester, you look up there and your board is filthy. So you need to get like the full clean cleaning yeah, the solution. Deep clean. Yeah. That, that, it feels like that's the kind of year that the Wild have had. Like, they've been over, able to overcome some of these issues, but they haven't been able to fully erase the issues. Like, there's a little residue stuck on them, and I think that's what you're talking about with the weight vest is all the residue from the trouble that this season has brought they're carrying around. And the hope is that the summer is that deep clean, right, that that solution that gets rid of some of that. Uh, but some guys that aren't going to be carrying that, let's, and now is a good time to probably get into the young kids, is uh, like Husnadinov and Olgren. Husnadinov has looked a lot better lately. I, I think he's, What do you like about his game? He's been good on the kill. So I think it's actually been the penalty kill where uh, he's found some success and maybe some confidence. So he, he can skate. We're, uh, I've seen his top speed and him playing the speed mostly on the penalty kill. And I don't know if it's the open ice or if he's got the freedom to go or um, if he's just good in that spot, but he's been good. Now, if he'll just kind of use that speed five on five to create offense, I think that, that like that's probably what they're trying to encourage. But extremely noticeable, good stick. He's smart. You could see he's reading plays. He's picking passes off. You know, he's. He, I think he's even at times baiting some of these NHL power play guys, which is hard to do. Like, I'm going to give you this. I'm going to take it away. And he's done that turn pucks over and he's going which i like like so vegas ended up scoring a shorthanded goal against us and uh, jack eichel was on the ice and i was thinking to myself you know what some teams have started to do this like it was a couple years ago that mcdavid was killing penalties and la or vegas has nine shorthanded goals on the year right now what the wild have like four or five get some of these skill guys out there killing penalties and if you have who's enough that has some skill maybe he's got some offensive upside so yeah pick that puck off Go, go get it, man. Uh, he and Hartman had a good one, so that was great. Like the way that he's playing, the battle levels there, and now I think that he's he's playing with another young guy, Ogren, and they rotated some vets on that wing in the in the San Jose game. Started to play with the puck a little bit more, and yeah, he got his first NHL goal. That's going to help as well too. Um, but what's what's he supposed to be like? I, I couldn't. Yeah, you know, I've watched a lot of World Juniors. He's been in that tournament many years in a row, and. Uh, I didn't notice him a ton, but I my understanding is Ogren's kind of like this. I think this is right. He's meant to be sort of like an Erickson Eck, right? Where you, over time, he's just this full 200 foot game, you know, and you kind of maybe appreciate him more and more as he kind of he becomes this sort of MVP type player. It seems like that's even been his role in Sweden. But I, I just what is what is that? What type of player is Ogi? Yeah, so Olgren, I think a good NHL comparable is going to be Chris Kreider. So he's a goal scorer then? So every year, if you look at his hockey DB or you look at his stats, every year he's got more goals than he does assists. Okay, so he's a tap-in guy. He's just – he can get the puck in the net. Natural but he can goal shoot. He, he can shoot the puck. Like watching in warm-up, this guy's got an absolute laser. Okay. So he can shoot. I think he's going to be able to score. I don't think he's one of those guys – like you have guys that – the, the way I look at it sometimes is 
And the NHL turns into a rush league, too. Like, uh, you, you get a lot of your offense off the rush. Somebody has to carry it through the neutral zone. And then once you enter the zone, you got one pass before there's, like, a scoring chance. So you need the guy that has the responsibility to lug the mail. Then you need the guy that can score. You also need the middle lane drive. What's Ecker? He's a middle lane drive. What's, what's Boldy? Or, and now this is what makes this line really good, Boldy and Kirill. They, they can do both. But more often than not, I think it's Kirill that's carrying the puck through the neutral zone. If you look at Boldy, he likes to make a lot of passes in the neutral zone so that he can get the puck back mm -hmm. in the scoring zone. So it takes time, it takes place to get to the scoring zone. And guys start to understand the role and, and what they have to do to be able to do that. And I think Ogren's going to end up being a guy that you – he's not going to lug the mail, get the blue line, cut east to west, find the trailer, and that trailer's going to shoot the puck and score. He's going to be the trailer. He, he's going to be the guy that shoots. Or he's going to be like Ecker, too, where he goes to the net. So Chris Kreider, if you look at the way they skate, like Ogren looks fast. He can shoot the puck. They, they look similar. Now, I don't think Ogren, I don't know if Ogren, if he does, if he approaches 40 or 50 like Kreider has, that, that'd be terrific. And Kreider, it took him a while to get good at scoring goals. Yeah, he scores a lot of goals. But I think that that's the kind of player he can be. He's more of a straight-line player. Like, if you think of Chris Kreider, mm -hmm. he's not east and west. He is a straight-line player, much like Eric Sinek, good around the net, very similar to Eck, but, like, maybe a little bit more offensive upside than Eric Sinek. That's and a great answer from the analyst. Okay, how about Husty? What's his uh, – give me a comparison there. Yeah, good question. I don't, I don't know because he's, he's smaller. Yeah. Uh, I think the best way to describe him is if he's going to play the middle, his ceiling might be a number two middle kind of, um, maybe even a number three middle. But he, he, he falls into that category where it's, it's tough. It's a tough spot. Like if you look at good number three centers in the NHL, the way that I like to build a team, it's uh, Adam Lowry. It, it'd be like a big guy that can play. He's going to get you 10 goals, 30 points. Um, and you use him as, like, your shutdown, solid defensive guy. Like, he, he mm -hmm. takes your draw on your penalty kill. Um, he plays against the other team's best at home. Um, I, I think that Husnadinov could be that guy. I just don't know about the defensive side of it. And I don't think that they want to stunt him by putting him in that spot either. But does he have the size to play that way? He doesn't. So um, he might be one of those guys, like a Giroux, where he – He's better off on the wing, but takes face-offs. And I'm not calling him Claude Giroux. Giroux's a, a different player for sure than Husnadinov, but uh, I'm saying that that might be it. If he's good in the face-off circle, maybe he's one of those guys. Move him out to the wing, let him use his speed, straight lines, get him the puck, maybe he can score, um, and put him in the dot, take a face-off, be a, a good penalty killer. Um, but if he could get you 15, 20 goals a year, I think you're stoked. I like it. That's some that, anyone who listened to this episode is getting some really good stuff. <laughs> I know this is like the hard time of the season. It's like not even the dog days. It's just like the this is if the, you're if you're so we're probably what how are we an hour into this thing or so. If you're hearing my voice right now, you are an awesome Minnesota Wild fan. <laughs> if you're this deep into the podcast, we're out of the playoffs. You guys are the ones that are we're going to build it with. Um, you know, breaking the mold for sure. You got anything else? Uh, not really. I I want to do uh, girlfriend teams for the playoffs, but let's wait till uh, we're not quite in the playoffs. I'd like to see the matchups. Um, I think it's kind of fun in the East. All these teams with two games, and they all have the same points, and um, that's kind of fun. They're like at the same points as us, basically. It's wild. Well, that race in the East is helping us. Like the 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 hunger that those teams have for points to get into the playoffs. Is pushing them out of the uh, draft position. Exactly. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, but it'll be interesting to see how that shakes out. And I get, I'm just going to get on board and, and try to watch it and care, even though it's not the wild, I guess. Um, we do have the PWHL. We'll maybe get us something. We'll see. But I don't know. Welcome back after a long road trip. Yeah, good to be back. Good to see you. Nice to just talk with you, Ryan. Yeah, yeah. it's like therapy. Yeah. It's, oh, it's always fun. It's nice out. Get the sunglasses on the hats, people. Pick the shorts out of the, out of the little bureau. And uh, I know, no spring hockey, but 
Life goes on. We'll figure it out. And if you made it this far into the episode, excess on who we should uh, we should request as the guest on the pod next week. Um, I think that uh, the Eric Sinek would be out, Brodine would be out, Carrillo would be out, <laughs> Caprice, Caprice. Maybe when he hears about this, but you know, other than giving like him all his of name, those guys, yeah, hit they, us with who you'd like. Ogi, Husty. Uh, I'm into all that. I'd, let's get a young buck. Let's get new car smell. Let's do it. A baby with a soft top to their head. We're here. Till it's here. <laughs> <laughs>